Witches have long captured people's imaginations across the world, embodying a fascinating blend of folklore, history, and mysticism. Historically, they have been mostly portrayed as forces of evil, but sometimes as forces of good as well, and as possessing supernatural powers to cast spells, brew potions, and commune with the spirit world. In today's world, stories of witches are regarded by many people as superstition, but there are others who insist they've had encounters with real witches, and the following accounts are from a few of such people who describe their terrifying experiences with real witches. My cousin, whom I'll call Jack throughout this narration, and I were venturing down a remote riverbank known to the locals of our town as Enchantress's Shore, discussing about the legend of the Witches of the Night. For a brief background, the legend of the Witches of the Night started around the 16th century, when the town was plagued by a series of unexplained tragedies. Crops failed, livestock fell ill, and children went missing. Desperate for answers, the townsfolk blamed a group of sisters, seven of them, known for their unusual beauty and affinity for the river. Accused of witchcraft and consorting with dark water forces, the sisters were sentenced to death by drowning. As they sank into the murky depths, they vowed to haunt the townsfolk for eternity. In the years that followed, strange occurrences supposedly plagued the riverbank, and tales of the malevolent witches spread like wildfire. The legend of the witches of the night was born, and over time the story became a myth and the riverbank was nicknamed Enchantress's Shore by the townsfolk. As Jack and I walked on discussing, I insisted that the story was nothing more than an ancient myth that had resurfaced and become popular after a bizarre incident involving a group of teenagers. We followed the winding path of the murky river, my dog in tow, when an otherworldly noise emanated from the dense foliage on the opposite bank. Initially it sounded like a mournful dirge, but it changed into the splashing of oars, then the sinister cackling of old women, and finally returned to the melancholic melody. My dog stared intently at the source of the noise, his fur standing on end, which set me on edge. The remote nature of the area made the sounds all the more unnerving. We stopped to contemplate the origin of the sound, when the water about thirty yards away started to churn violently. An unsettling sensation washed over me, as if the very fabric of reality had become twisted and unnatural. My senses felt scrambled, and a putrid odor of decay and brine invaded my nostrils. I staggered to the ground, catching glimpses of three figures emerging from the water at a disturbingly rapid speed. It reminded me of the sinister witches from a classic horror film. I glanced at Jack, who seemed unaffected, causing me to doubt my own perceptions. But when I looked back, Jack was doubled over, coughing and spluttering uncontrollably. The stench of rotting seaweed intensified, and I struggled to stay awake. My dog alternated between whining and growling at the frothing water. That eerie sound returned, like the wailing of lost souls, accompanied by fleeting images of shadowy cloaked figures skulking from tree to tree. The visual chaos made me feel faint. The water seemed to emit a low, haunting chant. I lay on my back, feeling consciousness slip away, when a sinister cackle echoed from above. I looked up and witnessed my worst nightmare coming to life. Three grotesque women stood before me, each with stringy wet hair obscuring their faces. Their features were hidden by shadows, but they wore tattered, seaweed-strewn gowns that reeked of death. They reached out with gnarled bony fingers, their nails like sharpened fish hooks. My dog lunged at the witches, allowing me to crawl backward in my weakened state, desperate to escape the horrifying trio. The nauseating odor of decay mixed with salt water was overpowering. The monstrous witches cackled manically before hovering above the ground and screeching in unison. They soared towards me before veering off, disappearing back into the river. I questioned my own sanity. Had I genuinely seen these nightmarish creatures fly into the water, or was it all a hallucination induced by the sickening fumes? The witches emerged from the water again, their twisted fingers reaching for me. I could finally see their faces horrifying combinations of extreme youth and advanced age. Their skin appeared smooth and unblemished, yet their visages resembled beautiful maidens, merged with hideous crones and monstrous fanged fish. Their eyes were dark, endless voids, and once I met their gazes I couldn't look away. Entranced by their dark power, they muttered sinister incantations in unison, 
and I felt my body lift off the ground. My head twisted backward, and I stared at the cold, dark earth as they hissed at me. An agonizing, burning sensation spread across my abdomen. Convinced that my end was near, my dog hurled himself at the witches with every ounce of strength he could muster. Startled, they released their hold on me, and I fell to the ground with a thud. I grabbed my dog's collar and pulled him towards the tree line, desperate to get as far away from the witches as possible. Their cackling laughter followed us as we retreated. I glanced back and saw them vanishing into the water, their grotesque forms dissipating into the murky depths. I managed to find Jack, who was gasping for breath, still lying on the ground. We helped each other up, and with shaky legs, we stumbled back towards the path, away from Enchantress's shore. The sun dipped behind the horizon, casting eerie shadows on the landscape as we left the sinister riverbank behind. When we finally reached the safety of our homes, we collapsed in exhaustion, our clothes soaked and reeking of brine and decay. We wondered if our harrowing experience had been a shared hallucination, or if we had truly encountered the witches of the night. To my absolute horror, I noticed three strange markings on my forearm, resembling the witch's twisted fingers. I realized that our encounter with the witches was no hallucination. Our brush with the supernatural had left a permanent reminder on my skin. I vowed never to return to Enchantress's shore again, and Jack agreed wholeheartedly. From that day on, our lives were forever changed. We could never look at the world the same way again, knowing that dark forces lurked in the shadows, waiting to prey on the unsuspecting. The legend of the Three Witches of the Night no longer seemed like a mere myth to us. It had become a chilling reality. In the small town of San Cristobal, located in the heart of Mexico, the legends of witches are deeply ingrained in local lore. My half-sister Isabella has a grandmother who fervently believes in the existence of witches, and she once shared with us a frightening story from her youth. Both Isabella and her grandmother are of Mexican descent, which made the story all the more haunting. In the early 1960s, Isabella's grandmother Rosa was living with her family near an ancient grove on the outskirts of San Cristobal. The grove was infamous for its eerie atmosphere and the rumors of supernatural occurrences that surrounded it. One evening as twilight fell, Rosa's younger brother Miguel stumbled upon a mysterious symbol etched into the dirt near the grove. The family gathered around it, and Rosa whispered, It's a witch's sigil. The others dismissed it as the work of mischievous children or superstitious locals. Rosa reluctantly agreed, but the sight left her feeling uneasy. That night, Rosa lay in bed and saw a strange figure cast upon the wall. It was a tall, slender woman with long flowing hair and an air of menace. As Rosa sat up, the figure vanished into thin air. When she shared her experience with her family, they attributed it to her overactive imagination fueled by local legends. Yet, Rosa couldn't shake the feeling that the figure was a witch as real as herself. As weeks passed, strange occurrences began to plague the family. Whispers in the night, objects moving on their own, and the pungent scent of herbs and potions. Desperate for answers, Rosa sought guidance from the village elders. A wise woman nodded gravely and said, Si la bruja del bosque encantado ha marcado tu hogar, Debes realizar un ritual de protección para alejarla y mantener a tu familia a salvo. Which means, yes, the witch of the enchanted grove has marked your home. You must perform a protection ritual to ward her off and keep your family safe. Others shared similar stories, which only served to strengthen Rosa's resolve to confront the malevolent witch. With her family by her side, Rosa prepared for a protective ritual at the edge of the enchanted grove. As the sun disappeared and darkness enveloped the land, they lit candles, burned sage, and began reciting ancient incantations. It was well past midnight when an otherworldly presence crept into the grove. From the shadows emerged a witch, her wild hair and piercing eyes more terrifying than anything Rosa had ever imagined. Anger flared in the witch's eyes as she whispered, This land is mine. I will curse you all. I will curse you all. Undeterred. The family continued the ritual, their voices growing louder and more confident. With a final powerful chant, a brilliant light burst forth from the candles, engulfing the witch in its radiance. She let out an unearthly scream and disappeared, leaving behind only a faint wisp of smoke. The witch never troubled Rosa and her family again, 
but the memory of that chilling night remained etched in their minds. Even now, as I explore the streets of San Cristobal with Isabella, I can't help but glance at the ancient grove and shudder at the thought of that witch's sigil. And sometimes, when night falls and shadows grow long, I find myself wondering if that sinister witch still lurks in the darkness of the enchanted grove, waiting to cast her spells on unsuspecting souls. Whenever I tell this story, my friends' faces turn pale and their eyes widen in a little bit of disbelief and also in terror. It's a story that seems to have grown with me, haunting my dreams and invading my thoughts. But now, I feel it's time to share this chilling tale with a wider audience. The legend of Pavilia Island, off the coast of Venice, is not one for the faint-hearted. This small island has a dark and twisted history, with stories of witches, malevolent spirits and gruesome murders. The locals dare not venture there and travelers are warned to stay away. But as a teenager, I found myself on this island not by choice, but by a bizarre twist of fate. My father was a cruel and abusive man who tormented my mother and me. One day, after another brutal encounter, my mother decided that we would be visiting her sister in Venice. I knew this was her attempt to escape our home and find some peace, if only for a short while. We arrived in Venice and stayed in my aunt's small, run-down apartment. My father unfortunately tagged along and, as expected, he continued his tirade of abuse even at my aunt's. One evening after being threatened yet again, I ran out of the apartment desperate to get away. My feet carried me to the harbor where I spotted a small boat. Without thinking I climbed in and began to row. The fog grew thicker, and I found myself lost in a sea of gray. I rowed aimlessly until I reached the shore of a small, eerie island. Exhausted, I collapsed onto the damp ground, my body shaking with fear and cold. As I lay there, a haunting whisper filled the air. I looked up and saw a figure standing before me, shrouded in darkness. Her eyes glowed a sickly green, and her long black hair seemed to twist and writhe around her. I chose to call her the Witch of Povelia, a powerful sorceress who had made a pact with the spirits of the island. Fear coursed through my veins, but the witch assured me she meant no harm. Instead, she offered to help me, to rid me of the monster that plagued my life. The cost, she said, would be a favor to be repaid in the future. Desperate and with nothing left to lose, I agreed. The witch led me through the fog to a hidden cave, where she performed a dark ritual, her voice a haunting melody that sent shivers down my spine. As the ritual concluded, the witch instructed me to return home, promising that my father would pay for his cruelty. I rode back to Venice, heart pounding with a mixture of fear and anticipation. When I arrived at the apartment I found my mother sobbing, with my aunt consoling her. She told me that my father had been found dead in a nearby alley, his body mangled beyond recognition. Overwhelmed by the revelation, I turned to the window and saw the witch standing on the distant shoreline of Poviglia Island, her eyes still glowing that sickly green. She raised a hand in farewell and vanished into the mist. Years have passed, and you can think whatever you will of me, but I have never once felt sorry or sad about my abusive father's death. However, I have tried to forget that fateful night, because I know the debt I owe the Witch of Pavelia remains. Sometimes, as I lie awake at night, I hear her whispers in the darkness, a haunting reminder that one day, she will return to claim her favor. And when that day comes, I fear for my soul. The story I'm about to share is tragic and may sound crazy and unbelievable, but I swear it's all true. I was on vacation at my grandmother's. She lives in a tiny village located deep in the mountains of Queretaro. My cousins and siblings were also there, and we were welcoming a new member to our family. My aunt had just given birth to her first child, a beautiful baby girl named Amelia. She was a fussy child, crying throughout the night, despite my aunt's best efforts to soothe her. The villagers would say that it was the witches that made her cry, seeking to possess and torment innocent souls. But we the younger generation from the city didn't believe any of that. To us it was all just superstition. Two weeks after Amelia's birth, most of our family had returned home to the city, leaving me, my cousin Marco, and my two younger siblings, Luis and Isabella, to stay with my grandmother and help with the chores. Amelia had her own room, 
separated from the rest of us to keep her nightly cries from disturbing everyone. That night, as the rest of us slept soundly, I awoke to the strangest sensation. A cold breeze swept across my face, and I could hear faint laughter coming from Amelia's room. I rubbed my eyes, trying to convince myself it was just a dream, but the laughter persisted. Shivering, I thought of my grandmother, hoping she was already tending to the crying child, and forced myself back to sleep. The following morning, as the sun's rays crept through the window, I heard my grandmother let out a blood-curdling scream. It seemed to echo through the house, waking everyone in an instant. I bolted out of bed and sprinted toward Amelia's room. The sight that met me was one I'll never forget. Amelia lay in her crib, lifeless and pale, with two small puncture wounds on her neck. I felt my knees give way and I collapsed onto the floor, my whole body trembling in horror. My grandmother, her eyes wide with terror, mumbled incoherently about witches and evil spirits. Marco and my siblings stood in the doorway, their faces ashen and their eyes filled with tears. The village elders were called, and they arrived with grim expressions, whispering among themselves as they examined Amelia's body. They confirmed my grandmother's darkest fears. Amelia's death was indeed the work of witches. In their wickedness, they had come to claim her innocent soul, draining the life from her in the process. The elders gathered us in the living room and told us the horrifying tale of the witches that haunted our village. It was said that they were once ordinary women, but they had turned to dark magic to satisfy their lust for power. They preyed on the innocent, stealing their life force and using it to fuel their wicked spells. The tale sent shivers down my spine, and I couldn't shake the feeling that the witches were still lurking nearby, watching us from the shadows. I could feel their malevolent presence, like a cold hand on the back of my neck. That night, none of us slept. We huddled together in the living room, the flickering light from the fireplace casting eerie shadows on the walls. Together with my grandmother, we all left the village soon after, and none of us, not even my grandmother, has ever returned. That experience will stay with me forever, and it taught me that not all superstitions are just mere superstitions. Thank you for watching, and thank you to all those who so courageously shared their stories with us today. If you enjoyed the video, then please like, share, and subscribe. And if you want more of our content, then please watch the videos suggested on the screen now. Until next time.